So what we have going here is that this is um, a new board that we put in the machines made by FAST. What this does is it replaces your uh, controller board that's in your current pinball machine. And um, as soon as you put it in, you can still play the original version of the code. So the ROMs and everything are already um, on this board, the way this board's laid out is this upper one right here is a CPU. Um, there's a um, pretty powerful processor on here that's doing all the 6809 emulation, has the ROM and all that. And then we have another processor down here that controls everything on the play field. So these two are working in cooperation to sit there and do a no latency uh, 1.0 um, experience. So right now I'm gonna go ahead and just start a game. Starting to hear that in there. Okay, we're just, we have the sound hooked in there too, so a little level checking. So one of the things I like to do, is there any way, okay, that's an awesome view. So one of the things I like to do to show that emulation is truly almost running in real time, I apparently not playing pinball very good today, is the flipper passing and stuff like that to see how the actual flippers are responding. So you, you see right, right there, you can actually do the uh, passes, like no problem, so the very short duration pulses. So it's showing that that has to be running pretty much in real time in order for it to do those to do those things. But where my world gets exciting now is we see that, okay, you can replace the board. We're right back where we started. It still plays the original stuff. But where it gets fun to me is we hit this one little button up here called the debug button. And you just notice that everything turned off on the machine except for the sound effects. So I'm going to kick in a, a terminal emulator right now. And um, terminal emulator, you guys know what that is? Okay. May not, but almost what's happening here is everything that I type on here is going to the machine. Anything the machine returns back comes back to the screen. So first let me get rid of that. Um, I'm gonna tell it what kind of board it is to start out. And I'm gonna turn off that sound effects. Okay, so now you can probably turn that up a little bit, Brian, if you want. So you served that, it, you just saw that it just turned off the sound. Well, the sound assets are already on there. They're all on the soundboard. So it gets pretty exciting now because if you were starting to make a 2.0 game or just want to mess around with this yourself, I can sit there and go start running some of the sound assets out there myself. Um, here's one we all like to hear. Extra ball! And so all the overlays and things like that going on, like the way that the um, original developers the machine had, if there's ducking going on for, for some of that sound, or um, if, if you did the slam tilt, that's one that shuts off everything kind of in the machine, so that's kind of a cool one. It's terrible sound on there, but it, you see that it kind of pretty much shut everything down. Um, so the, anyway, you have access to all the sounds. Uh, the next thing I like to do is kind of show off all of the uh, coils um, and start to map those out. So. If I type in a command here, I can. I'm, what I'm doing on the screen there is a stepping through all the coil numbers. And uh, did not turn the watchdog on. So you start to see, you know, the various flippers go. At some point in time, you'll start to see some of the flashers kicking in. These numbers that are going by on the screen are what driver that is. So I can sit there and, you know, start making a mapping of this. So if I'm going to write code against this game now, I, I know what all the drivers are. The switches are pretty easy. Um, when you press them, like that is switch number two that just came up on the screen. Here's the end of stroke. That's uh, number 58. So you can map all the switches out simply by pressing them. Um, and then another asset the machine has are all of the uh, switch matrix lamps. So we have another test that you can run through on that. So what's happening now is all the lights on the play field are starting to go. Uh, probably not the easiest to see on there. Um, we also can show which rows and columns they're at to kind of press the space bar. It takes about two hours to map out a game you know, sitting there and writing all this down, the switch, that light. You can also use the manuals. We try to keep everything in the same order as the manuals have in there. We even have little cute things that if you want to see what the uh, switch matrix is doing right now, we got a command right there to show, you know, what the switch matrix is doing at that point in time. Um, so after you sit there and map everything out, now you can sit there and start establishing some of the rules of what's going to happen. Um, let me go through real quick. We'll do... Um, Guys, choose something you want. Uh, uh, the knocker is always an easy one to get to. I can do, okay, well, let's hook the knocker up to the start switch just for fun. So what I'm gonna do is um, the start switch was number two. 
So I'm going to set up a rule here and I'm going to say, okay, uh, driver local on the machine, driver number six, which was a knocker. I want you enabled, hooked up to switch number two. Um, I want you to pulse for six milliseconds at full power. So if everything went right, right there, that rule's now been established. Until I change it, that's what the rule will be. And, and we have some ways you can go back behind and uh, look at what the driver actually is. So it's this number six one that we just did here. You can see enabled auto, switch number two, pulse, and then there's a six uh, milliseconds for at full power. What, what happens is that it sets up a bit mask. So it's like there's an eight bit bit mask that's going in there. So you could get down to one eighth duty cycle. So every millisecond, we're gonna choose whether a one or zero goes out to the driver board. They're not really analog. Um, just by nature of how much power a lot of the coils take and things, you wanna be in and out you know, relatively quick. You don't want it running in the analog range because that means the final drive will be taking the brunt of all that current and watts and uh, probably destroy itself. So anyway, when you're doing PWM, it is important on the way the shapes are. And so when we make our own hardware, the, the forebearers, when they made the hardware already have this in there. If you go too sharp, you throw out a whole bunch of EMI. If you go too slow with the waveforms, then you start to cause a lot of heat in your final drive. So we, we control that on, on when we're making the hardware at a really nice angle to sit there and keep the heat low and what have you. But um, anyway, yeah, so so yeah, the only drivers that you typically will PWM are ones like if you have a single flipper, that's the worst one because a flipper is so much current going in there. That PWM, that throws out a lot of noise and obviously the MOSFETs are taking a lot, but it's designed for it, but it's not, not the magnets are the ones that you need. Um, they throw out a whole bunch of flyback energy and things and will destroy MOSFETs if they're not handled correctly with some type of snubber or something. But yeah, all that typically was all built into the machine. So if you're taking a regular machine and just throwing our board in there and start doing it, you do want to observe the rules that the machine had. You don't want to all of a sudden fire a coil that was supposed to be at 30 milliseconds at 40 milliseconds because, you know, these machines, as old as they are, that bridge rectifier is weak. You start making things too hot. Next thing you know, the machine's not working real well. So um, I've had to replace our, our first game we ever did when we start running this in there. It was my Twilight Zone. It scared the crap out of us when we went to go turn the machine on and, and, and go in live. Every coil on the machine turned on. We had all the logic inverted. So instead of everything being off, we turned everything on. And um, shortly after, my bridge rectifier needed to be replaced. But uh, no fuses blew, oddly enough. I, I grabbed it in time to keep the fuses intact. So bridge rectifier did not like that. And so a lot of times what we'll do in the 2.0 games, when someone's starting, like they want a project to do that, we will go through and map out what the existing machine is already doing, like what are safe things to apply to the flippers, what are, you know, what have you. One of the things I really like to do too is, is I've been working on this document right now. It's just a, I'm kind of putting in, um, you know, doing that little two hour mapping, like where are the slingshots, where are the pops? As they start going on, I, I'm kind of putting all these like driver rules together. So this is about what I have so far. And so if I just go type this in uh, to the machine, now I have flippers going. I can sit there and eject a ball with the start switch. And I, I still have that dang roll on. <laughs> we put it in there just a second ago. But um, even things now like the VUK, there's a delay driver I have running in here. So when I go put it in the back, it waits for it to get on the sensor delays and all that's, you know, running completely in automatic mode. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, a, a code developer, when you're developing, you know, software for a pinball machine, you only care about the switches. It's the switches that do your sound effects, you know, update your points, uh, play some type of, you know, animation, whatever. It's all based on switches. So controlling all this at the lowest level makes a lot of sense. And then, of course, you know, we do have that watchdog in there that I started when we first started, um, you know, making the game go live. So if ever, you know, something did go bad with the code, it's like, this is my favorite light on the whole thing. You'll see it go there. That's the blinking light, sorry. When that's on, everything else on the machine is in lockdown right now. So it's like, when I see it, I know I'm not burning any coils up or anything like that on the machine, so. Um, because we had so much leftover horsepower and things, like the original pinball machine on the GI circuits only had 16 shades. But we pretty much have a dedicated processor at this bottom board, like I was showing earlier, that is sitting there running all the hardware. So you have the power, may as well use it. So we ended up putting uh, 256 shades of light on the GI. And so let me try to demonstrate that. I don't know how well it'll work on the video, but hey, this is what this is. Uh, 
So the command for that is GI, and then there's five of them in the system, and then I can tell it what value to go to. So hopefully the upper portion of the play field now, you can kind of probably see there, and I could see it on the camera a little bit. But uh, man, we can sure get down low, like LEDs, this all has a lot of LEDs, and to me they're always a lot, you know, pretty obnoxious by how bright they are compared to the incandescent lamps. So anyway, I have the ability now to turn those like way down. So they're actually still glowing. That's actually probably a little bit too much if you're playing the game, but obviously if we're doing special effects and things like that, if you're writing code against this, you could do that. Oh, I can't think of a really a whole lot else to show. Um, I, you know, I can take some questions if you have any questions or want to come up and play with this, or um, I can start to try to make some slingshots work or things that aren't working on the pinball machine right now. Yeah, so if you're talking more, because on these ones, all the legacy platforms, the System 11, 89, and 95, it's sort of like, you know, whatever the forebearers did on the project, the number of, like, whatever they did, right? But but if you're referring to what we do on a more modern system using, like, the Neuron and, you know, our network boards and all that, you just keep adding more and more network boards. They The part numbers in them, like a 3208 is indicating has 32 switches and eight outputs. So you buy the boards based on, you know, what the needs are for your machine. If you needed a lot more drivers, we have a 1616, so 16 switches, 16 drivers. Our smallest board is an 0804, so eight switches and four drivers. So you just put those wherever you want in the machine and, and, and just buy the number that you need to support the switches and drivers that you have. One really nice thing about the way our network works is that um, it's all identified from the start, like with the neuron board and each board in succession, it grows the switches and all that automatically for you. So the first board is always going to be driver zero, switch zero, and wherever it ends up. And so as you put them in, it just automatically will assign the higher numbers to whatever's there. So right now, I think we support 120 switches, and it's a ridiculous number. If if you hit it, I'd like to see what the heck you're doing with your machine. I don't know the number of drivers, but it's it's quite a bit. So, um, and there's really, the limitation is that I want to give the best response as possible for doing PWM. So we we actually have like timestamps on what we're doing in the code to see when we're, so anyway, we have a lot of room to grow. I just don't want to grow in dumb ways and then have, you know, have to limit it somewhere else in the future. So, so. So the ROMs are all still, you know, I'm sure most of that was written in assembly language for the emulated game. So, you know, and we don't touch any of that. Um, we're straight taking the ROMs um, with permission from Planetary. We run that through our 6809 emulator, and that's the existence that you get. Now, when you're doing a 2.0 game, you know, this is just being a terminal emulator. All you have to do is send those commands over to go make all this stuff work, right? So the majority, probably I would say 95% of the customers that use this are using uh, MPF. So that's written in Python and uh, you know that's their experience. I see one gentleman in the row that loves to write code. It's, uh, that's Eli over there, a member of the FAST team. Anyway, if we were to make a game, we would use C, C++, something like that, and, and probably on small platform. We, we like to get in, get dirty you know, do that kind of stuff. So our experience, depending if it was a machine that probably needed a segment display, I've never talked to Eli about this, but we'd probably use something like the Teensy, you know, to, to run something like that. If it was a pinball machine, probably getting the sounds and all of the displays running on that. If it was something more that needed some HDMI content, that might look something like a Raspberry Pi, a Nook, uh, some other, you know, system on module kind of, you know, experience. So it just depends on the horsepower we need and what we're trying to run up is unity. You're going to need a lot more horsepower, um, you know, that kind of, those kind of decisions. But um, anyway, as far as the hardware goes, you know, that's, you're really buying the PC based on the audio and video content or, you know, what other computer you're going to put in there. That's all, that's all the content decision. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, so and and so the way again this board works. I mean, we do have a you know a couple of places like if 
if you were doing some high volume game and it was something like, you know, the, the new Pulp Fiction, which is just based on segmented displays, you really could run that whole game from here, probably using just a Teensy or something or some, you know, Psalm type processor sitting up on here. If you were doing something that required more content, like a Raspberry Pi, HDMI, whatever, we do have some boards that will support a Pi being on it. The Neuron is one of those. So you could put a Raspberry Pi right on the Neuron board. And then you would be able to sit there and have your AV content coming off that. And then, of course, because you're sitting on the controller board, you also control the machine. But if you had something bigger, like, you know, some off-board nook and stuff, there's, you know, USB connector to go on there. But again, you know, the only thing you're really doing is kind of setting up the rules over that USB. The machine kind of still will do its own, own thing until you decide you want to change those rules. So. Yeah, any other questions I can... Get your own, own little whatever you want right now. You can ask me anything. I may not answer everything, but. <laughs> and if you want to come up and write some rules to make these slingshot works, we can do that too. <laughs>